Our next guest is one of America's most important documentary filmmakers. And it turns out that grief is also an influence in his life. He is Ken Burns, who's won every major award for his many series on historical events and figures as well as on social issues. But his latest work uses the medium of still photography. His new book, Our America, A Photographic History, collates images which charts the nation over nearly 200 years, as he now discusses with Walter Isaacson. Thank you, Christian and Ken Barnes. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Walter. Happy holidays. This is an amazing book. I mean, it's just a great series of photographs, and it begins with your father. Tell me about your father's influence on it. Yeah, it's huge. It's dedicated to him. Um, he was a cultural anthropologist, but an amateur photographer. And my very first memory, two and a half, three years old, was sort of snaking myself through the stud walls of a soon to be completed dark room that he was building in our basement in a track house in a development in Newark, Delaware, where he was the only anthropologist in the entire state. And then a second later, the next memory is of sitting in his strong left arm as his right arms manipulated the tongs and the smells and the eerie light and watch that magic still to me magic of 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 a blank sheet of paper suddenly becoming an image and you know i was hooked and the still image is still as a filmmaker the the building block the dna of what we do you talk about the influence of your father but of course your mother was a great influence in your life and uh in some ways a, a part of your soul. Tell me about that. Yeah, I don't think we'd be talking, Walter. I don't think we'd know each other if she hadn't lived and died. Um, she got cancer very, very early in my life, two or three years old. It was something that my younger brother Rick and I saw and witnessed. It was devastating. We didn't have a childhood. She died just a few months short of my 12th birthday when I was 11. A very heroic struggle. One of the most brave uh, human beings I've, I've ever met. And so a good deal of what I do for a living, as my late father-in-law said to me when I said I couldn't remember the day that she died. It was always approaching. It was always receding. He said, well, I bet you blew out your candles on your birthday cake as a kid wishing she'd come back. And I said, yeah, how did you know? And he goes, look what you do for a living. And I said, excuse me? He said, you wake the dead. You make Abraham Lincoln and Louis Armstrong come alive. Who do you think you're really going, trying to wake up? And of course it's her. And so she is ever present in my life. In, 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 there is not a day. And as you know, the half-life of grief is endless. And yet what we do with it the difficulties and the traumas is we negotiate art is is the negotiation of the fact that none of us get out of here alive and so i think my own work has been in a way a response to that trauma and a way to make lemonade out of the lemons i was handed as a little boy one of your other inspirations and mentors was uh, jerome liebling right and i think it's the cover of the book this yes. wonderful picture on the cover Tell me about him and why you chose this as a cover picture. Yeah, so when, when, when I watched my dad cry after my mom died when I was 12, and he'd never cried before, not when she was sick, not when she died, not at the very sad funeral, but he cried at an old movie that he let me stay up and watch, and I thought, I'm going to be a filmmaker. I'm going to be a filmmaker. I'm going to be, you know, Alfred Hitchcock or, or, or John Ford or Howard Hawks. But I ended up going to Hampshire College, a new, brand new experimental college in Amherst, Massachusetts. Massachusetts and fell under the sway of two social documentary still photographers, Elaine Mays and Jerome Liebling, uh, her senior. And he just gave me everything. He rearranged my molecules. He would say, go, see, do, be, engage in all of these things. And, and you know, I graduated in 75. He died in 2011. And there wasn't a moment when he wasn't my mentor still to that day. And even now, he, he, he feels very much a part of my life. And so there was no other photograph but his own to grace the cover, which is, I was asked by someone in an interview recently, what's the most important person, uh, you know, photograph in the book? And I said, oh, please, maybe it's the 1865 photograph 
photograph of Abraham Lincoln, the last photograph where he's holding the glasses. You just see the whole history of us in him. And I said, but equally important is this little kid on a, a street corner in, in New York City in 1949 with his improbable hot hockey shirt, these untied on, you know, shoes, shorts, a kind of wary thing, a little fedora on his hat. He's <laughs> holding his coat in front of a big sweeping arch of a of a bumper, a wheel hub of a of an old car from 1940s. And to me, if 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 the book exists in a space, it's in the very minimal space between Abraham Lincoln and this kid, and the huge space uh, between it. And and it is a testament to the extraordinary vision uh, and eye of Jerome Liebling that I am also here. Your documentaries deal fundamentally at times with race, whether it's the Civil War or jazz or baseball. And this book does the same from the cover photo to the very end. Tell me about why race is such an important part of the narratives. You know, I, I don't know where to begin. I can count on the fingers of one hand and still have a couple fingers left. The films that I've done out of the 40 or so that have been on PBS that that don't deal with race, because you cannot um, do a deep and responsible dive into American history without running up against this fundamental contradiction. We know exactly where we were born and when, and we know what our catechism is. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The guy who wrote that owned hundreds of human beings in his lifetime. And so we have in our own collective memory, a group of people who have had the peculiar experience of being unfree in a free land. And that has been the source of so much pain and so much tragedy in the history. And it's also been the source of so much joy and so much positive uh, investment. It, you can just, you know, Louis Armstrong alone helps to balance the scales of, of injustice with his extraordinary art. Um, but you've got, it's all there in front of us. So you can't help but do it. I mean, the main thing about us, Walter, is freedom, you know, like, and the tension in that, like what I want, personal freedom versus collective freedom, what we need. And they're often at loggerheads. And I think the book, without consciously or didactically or pedagogically saying it, you, you see that dynamic in it. You see the majesty of our beautiful continent that we inherited. You see the tragedy of the dispossession of the native peoples. You see all of those tensions. But I think underlying so many is what historians, uh, my goodness, I'm an amateur one, would call our original sin which is the original sin of tolerating chattel slavery, just as we are proclaiming to the world a new form of government that was going to be based on the principles of the Enlightenment and the equality of all human beings. You titled the book Our America, and the pictures show the great diversity of our America. But the title also implies that there are things that we share. Yeah. Tell me what that you're trying to show that we share. Well, I think, you know, you know, Walter, everybody's talking about, oh, we can't teach our kids the sad stuff. We can't do this. We can't do that. We can't talk about this. And, we, and I just realized these are the hallmarks of a, of a tilt towards a kind of an authoritarianism in which you suddenly take, uh, you know, the nationalist approach, which is, you know, all human beings do horrible things. You know, every culture everywhere, you know, it's 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 a litany. What you want to do is say, let's own it all. The hallmark of a great country is to embrace its diversity and understand that in the case of the human resource of it, that diversity has been a strength. As Pete Hamill said, that's an alloy much stronger than its constituent parts. And at the same time, we can know that the that the ongoing struggle for freedom has always been complicated and is ongoing and the fragility of that republic that Franklin thought that, you know, would be, you know, if you can keep it goes along for 250 years almost and and yet now the things we've taken for granted through the first crises the civil war the depression the second world war you know of of a free and fair elections of the peaceful transfer of power of an independent judiciary now all seem kind of up for grabs and we've kind of can sense the tenuousness you know we've been through this stuff before we'll go through it again we just have to periodically re-remind ourselves of that complexity and and let's let's celebrate that complexity as i say in the introduction 
it's our America, an attempt to gather the sense of us in the U.S., but it's also my America, right? It's just my attempt to say, this is what I've learned. Every 50 state is re is, is represented here. Near, nearly every project that we've ever worked on is there, but not didactically. There are people playing, you know, having a tug of war in downtown Putney, if you can call it downtown Putney, Vermont. There's a beautiful gal from my little village in New Hampshire. There's girls dancing on the beach in what must have been risque, but seems to us completely covering their body swimsuits in Jamestown, Rhode Island. You know, there's a kid with, uh, you know, a, a six shooter, uh, you know, toy gun playing. Uh, they're native peoples. There's um, celebration and dance and music and art and life. Uh, but there's all the other things that we are also too. And you don't stay great if you think you're going to paint a sanitized Madison Avenue version of yourself. It just, it ain't going to happen. So our history is checkered, but there is no one on earth whose history is checkered. Just beware the people who sell you that Madison Avenue treacly white picket fence morning in America have 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 missed the story of us which has been my beat and and this is just an another form of ex, of exploring it I was struck by the picture of the Fuji Athletic Club yeah and it yeah. was not just the interesting picture. This is a case where I went to the back and read all about it. So sometimes it helps to know the backstory too. Yeah, well, this is, I, this is what I think is that, you know, it really requires two passes. One, let the photograph work on you. And then you can keep your fingers and go back and forth. Because in the case of that, a late 19th century photograph of a Japanese base, a Japanese American baseball team in the United States. Well, you know, this is part of the adoption of our national pastime. What you don't know is that the guy in the lower right-hand corner is a man named Chiro Obata. Chiro Obata will become a really well-respected um, painter, but he will also be, at the beginning of the Second World War, interned in an internment camp and will have to struggle as an artist. So this film you know, straddles our baseball series and it straddles our film on the national parks and it straddles other things that have done, have dealt World War II that have dealt with Japanese internment. But he becomes a great champion of the national parks and then uses the strengths of the redwoods and the sequoias to permit him to figure out how to negotiate the indignity of him, an American citizen, having to be in, in uh, interned uh, for the duration of the war in one of the most um, you know, scandalous uh, things that, that we've done in our long and at times sordid history. I think the only person who appears twice in the book uh, is Abraham Lincoln. First, the amazing picture of him at the end of his life, and then him as the Lincoln Memorial. And both of those pictures talk about what you talk about, the struggle for freedom, the That's march right. to freedom, democracy, if we can keep it. If we can keep it. Yeah, that's right. And you know, there's another one, just a few pages after that picture, that beautiful picture in early 65, the last picture, port sitting portrait of him that's so beautiful and so famous and everything is etched. Everything we've been through and everything we're going to go through is, is etched in his face. The story and, of America seems, and the fight for freedom all seems etched in Lincoln's face it, it, in that all photograph. There. And he's exactly. able to he's able to capture us in, in, as we know, the best language that any president has, has used. He's also, a few pages later, they're burying him in, in Springfield, Illinois, in a soft spring rain, because sometimes when you're at the crux of these American questions, violence often comes and violence is a byproduct but there he is enshrined in the most beautiful of all memorials of all time the lincoln memorial and he's you're you're up behind him and he's listening because what's happening and you don't know this it just says washington dc 1963 it doesn't say august 28th 1963 somebody said oh that's dr king's march on washington no you, you can find that in the back matter. You're looking at Lincoln watching something take place over his shoulder. You're with him still. He lives still in the hearts of all of us, as the dedication says, and the nation that he saved. And out there is Dr. King re-upping. You know, if, if Jefferson is the 1.0 and the Gettysburg Address and Lincoln's 
total body of action is the 2.0, then King is saying the 3.0. He's coming to collect the promissory note, but he's also got a positive vision of where we can go. And in fits and starts, we've gone there, we've taken steps backwards, we sort of feel things retrenching now, but you know, we'll push forward. And I, I hope that the book is seen as not dark, but as hopeful in, in that way. Another part of the march and fight uh, for freedom in America and the struggles has been for women. And there's a juxtaposition of pictures in the book. There are two pictures in the book that uh, struck me. One is, I think, Jamestown Beach, uh, the girls dancing on the beach. And then a very iconic photograph of Susan B. Anthony. Yeah. Tell me how those play off each other. I love the severity of Susan B. Anthony. She is the sort of walking face of the movement that she and Elizabeth Cady Stanton sort of ha- started back in, a- in 1848 with the Seneca Falls Convention. And their language is what will eventually, long after their death, 15 years after their deaths or so, will be enshrined as the amendment giving women the right to vote. 144 years, Walter, after the Declaration of Independence, more than half of our population finally gets partially some rights uh, in it. But also we have to remember there's the irony of a black slave, enslaved woman holding a white baby. You would trust your most precious thing, but you can't extend to those people who take care of your most precious thing anything other than in, you know, uh, enslavement. That that's where the contradiction goes. Early in the book, you have the photograph of the U.S. Capitol. It's uh, 1846, it says. Did you think of ending the book with a picture of the Capitol under siege in 2021, or would that have somehow warped what you were trying to say in the book? I think it would have warped in every sense of that word, Walter. I mean, as I said, you know, we, we're in the history business, and it means that we sort of treat the near present with a kind of impressionistic arm's length. Um, we wouldn't want to go up to the very present because it then becomes a priori didactic and binary. And what you want to do is begin to understand that this, you know, world we live in, both a media culture, good, bad, red state, blue state, or the computer world that dominates everything, whether we're aware of it or not, a one or a zero, isn't actually what anything that human life is about. It can't not produce a Leonardo da Vinci. It cannot produce a Benjamin Franklin or a George Washington or you know, a Ruby Bridges or, you know, uh, Emmett Till's mom, you know, it just, it's, there's something else going on. And I want to know about that something else. And I don't want to be distracted by that. In a book like this, it's our story. And let's, I want to keep as many of our brothers and sisters engaged in this story as possible. Ken Barnes, thank you for joining us. Thank you.